tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. Two families move into an idyllic suburb only to discover that their homes lie on top of an abandoned graveyard. Soon they are tormented by strange phenomena and threatening apparitions and are driven into a state of complete terror. Are the spirits of the dead seeking vengeance on the living for the desecration of their graves? It was an affair that began with an all-consuming passion, but quickly disintegrated. Now both Joanne Albanese and John Edwards are missing. Could their love have transformed into a deadly obsession? Halloween 2001, Penn State University. 21-year-old senior Cindy Song partied into the wee hours of the night, then grabbed a ride home with a friend. Cindy waved goodbye and headed up to her apartment. She has not been seen or heard from since. These mysteries are all stories of personal quest for the truth and a final solution. Someone watching may know where that solution can be found. Perhaps it's you. Just outside of Houston stands a Newport subdivision, known for its 1,500 upscale homes, manicured lawns, and bucolic setting. In the early 1980s, Sam and Judith Haney bought a house at the far western edge of the development. When we bought the house in Newport, it was the house that we had always been looking for. So it, it was the house that we intended to stay at for a long period of time. But there was a morbid secret about the Haney's perfect home, one that would soon turn their lives into a never-ending nightmare. It all began when a mysterious stranger showed up at their door with an ominous warning. Yes? This elderly man told me that he had noticed that we were putting a swimming pool in our backyard and that um, there was something about our backyard that I needed to know about. So I followed him around to my backyard. He pointed at the ground and said that there are some graves right here. There were two graves. And he marked a spot on the ground where they were. And I really didn't know how to react to that. I didn't know if he was just joking. I couldn't understand why anybody would want to joke about something like that. All of a sudden, just from a knock on the door, our beliefs, our emotions, everything sort of changed because it was like, gracious, I have bodies in my back of my yard. Using a backhoe, the Haney's decided to see if the man's alarming claims were true. Dave, stop, hold it, hold it. I think I see something. we encountered some wood fragments. And at that point, we stopped with the backhoe. And we got down into the hole and continued digging by hand. There was pine boards. When we lifted up the first board, we could see the indentation of a skeleton form. It didn't take long to figure out that it was an actual human remains. Sam had uncovered a very old pine coffin. Over the years, it had been crushed by the weight of the earth. Sam immediately called the sheriff and county coroner who conducted an official exhumation. Most of the bones had turned to powder but 25 fragments were found, 
some so brittle that they disintegrated when touched. A second coffin, located alongside the first, was left untouched. Two wedding rings were on the frail index finger of the exposed skeleton. They handed me the rings, and it was sickening. My feelings were sick of my stomach to think that I had desecrated somebody's um, grave, horrified me. Aghast at the thought of human remains beneath their plush green lawn, the Haneys vowed to find out their identities. Their search led them to a longtime resident named Jasper Norton. As a youth, Jasper had dug several graves in the area. He told the Haneys that their home and surrounding houses were built on top of an old African-American cemetery called Black Hope. The deceased were mainly former slaves. The last burial was in 1939, and as many as 60 people were interred there in paupers' graves. The people had no, very little money. They marked their graves however they could, uh, with markings on trees, with little stones, with uh, fences around them like a family plot. The two people buried in the Haney's backyard were Betty and Charlie Thomas. This picture of Betty is the only known photograph of either one. Census records reveal that the married couple were born into slavery in the mid-1800s and freed after the Civil War. They died during the 1930s and their graves were eventually forgotten. Betty and Charlie's family wasn't there anymore and it was up to me to give them the dignity that they deserved, and that was very important to me. Judith and Sam Haney made an extraordinary decision. Plagued by guilt for digging up the Thomases, they reburied the long-departed couple in their own backyard. I'm so sorry. The Haneys resolved to live peacefully side by side with the Thomases, but according to the Haneys, what would follow was anything but peaceful. There was a clock in my bedroom, and one night it started sparking and putting out sort of a blue glow. When Judith checked the clock, she found that it was unplugged. The clock was only the beginning. One evening, Sam went to work the night shift, leaving Judith alone. What you doing? I heard the sliding glass door open, and I heard which I thought was Sam saying, what you doing? And that sort of shocked me, and I thought, well, he forgot something. Everything was quiet. The sliding glass doors were locked. And I thought, well, you know, you must be losing your mind. <laughs> this really must be getting to you. But much to my amazement, that's not where the story ended. In the morning, I awoke went in my closet to get my red shoes, and I could not find them anywhere. So, of course, I started looking for them and went through all of her closets where she normally puts things, and we just couldn't find it. We had walked just a short distance where the grave sites were, and I could see something on the grave. It was the shoes that Judy was looking for that morning. And they were both side by side, like someone had just picked them up and carried them over and laid them down on the graveside. 
Even more disquieting to the Haney's was when they realized what day this was, Betty Thomas's birthday. And I kind of got the feeling that it was like Charlie was giving Betty a birthday present. I began to come to the realization that this was not all in my mind and that this had to have some relationship to Betty and Charlie's graves being disturbed. Their spirits were saying, this isn't right. The Haney's are not alone. A dozen neighbors whose homes were built on top of the abandoned cemetery reported lights, televisions, and water faucets turning on and off for no apparent reason. Many claimed to hear unearthly sounds. Some even saw supernatural apparitions. And there seemed to be an increasing maliciousness to the bizarre events. Could the spirits of the Black Hope Cemetery, angry at the desecration of their graves, be seeking vengeance? Like the Haney's, Ben and Jean Williams thought they had found suburban paradise when they moved into the same neighborhood. And then after we moved in, everything changed. When I tried to plant new plants, they just would not live. No matter what I did, you know, fertilizer, whatever, I, they still did not, would not live. And um, I constantly had a foreboding feeling, a feeling of things are not right or something bad is about to happen. The Williams said that near the flowers, sinkholes appeared in the unmistakable shape of a coffin. The Williams would fill them in, only to have them mysteriously reappear a few days later. The Williams also noticed strange markings on an oak tree by the sinkholes. An arrow pointed towards the ground. Beneath it were two horizontal slash marks. A longtime resident of the area told the Williams he was the one who had marked the tree as a way to identify where his two sisters were buried. I was devastated. I couldn't believe that, you know, my God, here we are living on, on top of graves. I felt guilty. And uh, I felt like, well, I mean, we, we've desecrated graves. According to the Williams, their ideal home was soon invaded by a menacing presence. Nebulous shadows rapidly slid along the walls. Whispered words and a putrid smell followed in their wake. Had the dead sisters or other spirits disturbed from their eternal resting places come back to life? At the time, the Williams' granddaughter, Carly, lived with the couple. During the blazing heat of summer, Carly said she would stumble into bone-chilling pockets of freezing air. It would be very, very chilly, and you'd have just this feeling of foreboding or just, you know, like either something wasn't right. Anywhere in the house, you would have a feeling that you were not alone, that somebody was watching you. It terrified me to be in the house by myself. The toilets used to flush on their own. Do you hear the voices? As the water went down, I could hear, it was almost like conversations. Like I could hear people murmuring to themselves. It was a presence or spirit or something there, something that wanted to be her, wanted me to know it was there. One time, Carly and I decided to take a nap. Carly had her book and she was reading. And all of a sudden, Did we heard that? the back door yeah. open. What was it? Someone come in, close the door. We heard footsteps coming up the hall. We both looked at each other, and, and then we both looked towards the door. It was at this point that I realized somebody was in our house that didn't belong there.
We looked everywhere, nothing. There wasn't a soul in that house but us. What the noise was, I don't know. It's locked. That was terrifying. Even to this day, I still feel it was a presence, like a ghost, if you will. I mean, it was, it was something there. It was something that was trying to scare us. I absolutely believe that all of these things happened to us because we were on the graveyard and that we were simply going to be tormented until we left there. As the unexplainable phenomena seemed to increasingly target the Williams, Ben and Jean debated what to do next. And me and Jean, we talked it over. And she said, well, what can we do, walk off and leave it? She said, we ain't got enough money to pay it out on another home. I said, we always been fighters. We're gonna stay right here and fight it and, and try to beat it. It wasn't long before Ben got his chance. I came home from work around 10 after 12 for midnight shift and I walked straight to the kitchen, opened the refrigerator door. And that's when I seen these two ghostly figures. And they went straight backwards in, into the den. And then they started moving toward the hall going down to the bedroom. I noticed that they was heading right down the hall to Jean's. Well, when I walked through the bedroom door, instead of two forms being there, there was just one. And it was standing right about a foot and a half from the end of the bed. And the only thing I really thought of, they ain't messing with my wife. As I dove through it, I felt a sticky, cold sensation in my body. Are you okay? And I turned around, looked at the end of the, end of the bed, and was nothing there. But the Williams nightmare was far from over. In rapid succession, six of the Williams' immediate relatives were diagnosed with cancer. Three succumbed to the disease. You just don't have that much sickness and death in that short a period of time. These spirits of the dead wanted me and my family to get off of their graveyard. The Haney's lives were also unraveling. I was crying all the time. I was frightened. I was scared of doing my daily routine in my own home. If you can think of every gambit of emotions that a person can have, I was going through those things. The Haney's decided to fight back in court. They sued the developer for not disclosing that their home was built over a cemetery, in part so that everyone would know what was happening at the Newport subdivision. A jury awarded them $142,000 for mental anguish, but in a devastating reversal, the judge ruled on legal grounds that the developers were not liable. The verdict was thrown out, and the Haney's ordered to pay $50,000 in court costs. And at that point, we decided to file bankruptcy. So all in all, we ended up losing the case, losing the money, losing the house. We were exhausted, and we got in our car and went where there was love and support and tried to put it behind us. The Williams also explored legal recourse, but they say they were told that without definitive proof of a cemetery on their property, nothing could be done. 
To complicate matters, it was illegal in Texas to disturb a grave without permission from the family. It was then that Jean made a decision she will forever regret. That was the last straw. You want a body? I'll show you a body. So I thought to myself, I can dig and I can dig about two feet a day, and I knew I would reach a body. But soon after she started digging, Jean felt ill. I'm gonna do the rest later. I'm gonna take over, okay? Okay. Her daughter, Tina, volunteered to finish the job. And she dug for, I'd probably say almost half an hour. Ooh. Are you okay? Yeah, I feel just a little faint. I'm digging. And um, I remember her saying that she, was, that she felt funny. Um, she was getting dizzy as well. And uh, she put the shovel down and she went back inside. You lay down, honey. And she just laid down on the couch. Okay. She's like, Mom, Daddy, I don't feel right. You know, there's something wrong. We got to call 911. The last thing I remember her saying was, um, Mommy, Tina, take care of my baby. Right. Take care of my baby. And she right. looked so scared. Talk to me, Tina. Almost immediately, her eyes started glazing She's over. And I was talking to her, She's trying to talk her out of dying. Please, Tina, talk to me. And all this time, her eyes were changing until they got to the point where I knew that she wasn't with me or she wasn't, you know, responding at all. Tina had suffered a massive heart attack. Two days later, she died. She had just turned 30 years old. And I realized that I had desecrated another grave, and now I'm paying. I told Ben, I says, we have to get out of here. It doesn't matter what we lose, what we add. Nothing matters except that we get out of here. And I knew that if we didn't, that I was not going to make it because my fight was gone. I could fight no more forever. Fine. Great. How you doing? The Williams escaped to Montana and later moved back to Texas. Today, they are a happy, growing family, no longer plagued by mysterious noises, horrific apparitions, or heartbreaking tragedies. <laughs> None of the subsequent residents living in the Williams, Haney, or other nearby homes ever experienced any paranormal activity. If we would have known what was going to happen, we would have left a lot sooner than we did. A lot sooner. We paid the price. Oh, the price was so heavy. We paid with our family. We paid with our health. We paid with our savings. Everything was gone. If we had not left the cemetery, we would not be here today. I believe that. After spending a long weekend with her divorced father, Amber and Brittany Albanese returned to the Las Vegas home they share with their mother, Joanne. The two girls quickly notice telltale signs that something is not right. Joanne's two daughters came home and they found uh, mother wasn't home. Joanne was not there, which might have not been that uncommon. But when they went in her bedroom, they found her purse and they found particular items of jewelry that Joanne only took off when she showered. Immediately upon completing the shower, she would put them back on. After Joanne failed to turn up the following day, she is reported missing. Las Vegas police detectives soon discover that a second person has disappeared. Joanne's boyfriend of five months, John Edwards. It appeared that his boyfriend, girlfriend, 
went out on an outing and just hadn't returned yet. And when Joanne and John failed to show up at work, contact her family, that's when we figured we had better take a little closer look at it. After years of suffering through disappointing dates and dead-end relationships, Joanne Albanese believed she had finally found the perfect mate. John Edwards was handsome, charismatic, and attentive to her every need. John would often take Joanne on romantic getaways, and initially police thought the couple had simply left for the weekend. But as the investigation unfolded, it became apparent that John Edwards was not who he seemed to be. Remember the guy I told you about? Very charming, uh -huh. no wife, no kids. Uh -huh. Well, he's back there training somebody. A friend introduced 39-year-old Joanne Albanese to John Edwards, and she soon agreed to date the smooth-talking fitness trainer. Nice to meet you, Joanne. Joanne, like most women, thought him to be you know, a very dynamic and uh, very interesting and attractive man. They began going out quite a bit. John Edwards quickly integrated himself into Joanne's life, and the two appeared to be madly in love. But it wasn't <laughs> long before disturbing signs emerged that Edwards was no Prince Charming. Strawberry. It looks like it. Edwards paid for nothing, apparently living off of Joanne's earnings. Hey, hey, you brought the wrong and his charm had transformed into an all-consuming possessiveness. If Joanne complained, John reportedly became violently angry. Will you shut up? He makes sure that he's pretty much the only person she's with. Uh, obviously, she was with her children as well, uh, but uh, that he takes up most of her time. He, from what we understand, uh, even made sure that he was there when she would go to the bathroom. On the day of her disappearance, Joanne left her job at 4.30 p.m. She allegedly told family and friends that she planned to end her relationship with John at dinner that evening. Joanne was never heard from again. Four days later and 250 miles away, Joanne's car was found parked in a remote desert area outside Prescott, Arizona. There was no sign of Joanne or John. The car noted us nothing. Finding the car abandoned where it was, um, it pretty well confirmed our fears that we had a foul play incident here. Police discovered a truck parked outside Joanne's home that was positively identified by witnesses as belonging to John Edwards. That truck would expose a first crack in Edwards' carefully constructed facade. Go ahead and run the uh, plate on the bin for me. We ran that license plate, and it came back as absolutely no record, which is rather unusual. What do you got, Fred? Plate doesn't go to the vehicle or to anyone in particular, so there's a problem there. Somebody's trying to cover something. We started questioning whether or not uh, John Edwards was who he claimed to be. Any doubts police had about Edwards' identity were confirmed when they searched the house where he was staying. So we began looking through some of his belongings and we found a wallet that was uh, duct taped, closed. Bingo. And when I opened that wallet, I found identification with the person we knew as John Edwards, but it was the name of John Addis. Hello, John Patrick Addis. Alaska driver's license, a certification card from the state of Alaska saying he is certified in crime scene investigations. Let's check it out. So we realized at that point that the person we were told was John Edwards was in fact a John Addis. Who was John Addis? And why had he gone to such extreme lengths to conceal his identity? The answer to that question did not bode well for the ultimate fate of Joanne Albanese. As detectives delved into Addis's past, they uncovered allegations about a vicious trail of battered women that began in the Alaskan wilderness. Las Vegas police discovered that John Addis was actually once a law enforcement officer himself. He joined the Alaska State Troopers in the early 70s and quickly rose up the police ranks to become a crime scene investigator. John was a very intelligent man. As an investigator, John really wasn't a people person as much as uh, some others perhaps were. But if you wanted good science at a crime scene, and uh, someone who could think in these terms and these concepts. John Addis was the guy. 
By 1980, John Addison and his wife Jody had been completely accepted by the tightly knit Fairbanks law enforcement community. It wasn't such a big waste. We got to see the territories. Hey, mother. Only Jody was aware her husband had a darker side. Here you go. He was very controlling. It started out by just pushes or sh shoving, um, and then it was grabbing my hair, um, pushing me up against the wall with his hand against my throat. I told you to stay away from those people. I told you not to talk to them. You can't treat me this way. I treat you any way I damn well feel like. After 11 years of marriage and four children, Jody finally had enough. While a couple were driving into town, John started yet another fight. I decided I can't live like this anymore. So I had to make a decision. I decided I am not going to put up with this. And I jumped from the vehicle. Although John reportedly chased her down and threw her back in the truck, Jody ultimately was able to escape. Shortly thereafter, she was granted a divorce. In the ensuing years, Addis quit his job as a state trooper and married wives number two and three. I started to trace back um, all of his prior relationships. What I saw was an escalation in violence. He was extremely violent with his third wife, who, after just having a baby with her, he was choking her so badly that her feet were off the ground. He had physically raised her as he was strangling her. It was during this time that John Addis abducted his four children from his first marriage. He was arrested and served one year in prison before being paroled to Fresno, California. But John Addis broke his parole and disappeared from sight. Five years later, Addis resurfaced in Las Vegas as John Edwards, where he met Joanne Albanese. Authorities now believe that Joanne tragically became the alleged chronic batterer's first murder victim. Our best guess on what happened was probably before they went to dinner, they got into a heated argument. And as a result of that argument, we firmly believe that um, John and her got into a fight and John killed her. And once she was dead, John panicked. John packed her into her own car and drove her down to Arizona and ultimately disposed of the body and the car outside of Prescott, Arizona. A full three years after her disappearance, a hunter discovered Joanne Albanese's skeletal remains one mile from where her car had been abandoned. A warrant for murder was issued for John Addis. He has now been missing for six years. This is not a stupid individual. This is a homicide detective who taught crime scene investigation. He's as sharp as they come, and that's what makes him tougher to find. John Addis won't be easy to catch and, uh, and won't be easy to, to arrest. I hope I'm wrong. I hope he watches this uh, segment and, uh, and decides to do the honorable thing and give himself up. I'm strong, I'm beautiful, I can do anything I want. The words of Cindy Song, posted to her personal website eight months before her scheduled graduation from Penn State University in May 2002, a day that would celebrate a lifelong dream. Cindy grew up in South Korea, 
but left in 1995 to live with her aunt and uncle in Virginia and attend high school. Her past rich in family tradition, her future full of promise, Cindy was enjoying every minute of her newfound freedom in America. But on Halloween 2001, Cindy Song's dream was apparently shattered. It was a Wednesday, the perfect excuse for students to party on a school night. Cindy and two of her girlfriends, Stacy Peck and Lisa Kim, showed up at their favorite haunt dressed in costumes, ready to drink and dance the night away. Cindy wore a rabbit outfit. She had bunny ears and a tail that she had bought. It was a very cute outfit. It wasn't like a sexy outfit. It was a very cute outfit. That was her thing. She was very cute. She liked to look cute. The girls partied until 2 a.m. Next stop, a friends to play some video games, then home. Okay, call me. It was now 4 a.m. on Thursday, November 1st, 2001. <laughs> Stacy waved goodbye to her friend and drove off. She never saw Cindy enter her apartment and has not seen her since, nor has anyone else. Cindy Song simply disappeared that night. Police were baffled. We have no body, we have no crime scene, and we have no actual crime. Uh, so it's been uh, very frustrating uh, without any of those pieces of the puzzle. And because of that, it, it, it seems that she just vanished in thin air. Back in Seoul, South Korea, Cindy's mother learned the heart-wrenching news. I wanted to be here for her, but I was in Korea at the time. If God will just allow me to see her, hear her, and touch her again, I will be so grateful. Cindy's song was known to have an independent streak and liked to be spontaneous. But she was also hardworking and responsible. An art major who achieved good grades and held down two jobs. Friends say running off on a whim was simply not something Cindy would ever do. Questions and theories concerning what may have happened to Cindy abound. Yet her fate remains a complete mystery. What happened? I kept on calling her. A search of Cindy's apartment a few days after her disappearance showed no sign of any struggle. But there were some clues. We found her eyelashes on the counter because she was wearing fake eyelashes. So we knew that she must have at least come in and took those off. And her backpack was in her room as well, which she had been carrying earlier. So we knew that she at least came in and dropped that off. Another clue, Cindy's cell phone still in her bag. According to friends, she never went anywhere without it. Her bunny costume, however, was nowhere to be found. I don't think she ran away because we know that she just whenever she left the apartment, she was wearing the clothes she had on that night. Uh, we also know that her, her purse or pocketbook or whatever she had with her that evening that contained her driver's license and credit cards uh, were with her too, because we could not locate those in the apartment. Detectives check Cindy's phone records. No calls in or out then her credit cards and email. There was no activity on her credit cards, and there were no uh, emails or any activity on her email accounts that gave us any clue on to her disappearance. Early November, police and volunteers combed a wooded area near Penn State University. No trace of Cindy Song. She had apparently vanished leaving detectives with nothing to go on but hunches and theories. First, Cindy's state of mind. Had she become depressed and taken her own life? Friends say no way. They remembered Cindy's upbeat mood on Halloween night. That's actually how she always is. She's very bubbly. She's just always happy, and she always wants everyone else to be happy around her. So if Cindy wasn't depressed, had she perhaps run off somewhere without telling anyone? That theory was also quickly dismissed. 
When we conducted the initial search of her apartment, uh, some of the things we found were two tickets to a Britney Spears concert that were coming up uh, a couple days after her disappearance. And we also found some printouts from where she had ordered a computer and was due to be delivered, I believe, on November 6th. So that if she was gonna leave the area on her own, she wouldn't have ordered these or planned to attend uh, those functions. So what did happen to Cindy's song that Halloween night? Friends said it wasn't unusual for Cindy to run out to a nearby 24-hour market, no matter how late it was. Upon her going there or coming back, uh, something happened, such as an abduction. Uh, maybe somebody had uh, grabbed her and abducted her. A few days after Cindy's song disappeared, a chilling scene reportedly unfolded in Philadelphia's Chinatown district nearly 200 miles from Cindy's apartment. A woman matching Cindy's description was seen crying and yelling for help. Later, the eyewitness came forward with a description of the alleged abductor. A police artist created this composite drawing of a man with olive to light brown complexion and medium length hair. He is not a suspect, but police would like to question him. Meanwhile, Cindy's mother flew to Philadelphia to help in the search. Since her arrival, Ben Soon's song has kept her daughter's story alive locally, while also generating national and international coverage. It is a seemingly endless ordeal, yet she is not about to give up. I want to stay in America until I can find Cindy. I will do anything to find Cindy, because Cindy is always in my heart. This is the last photo of Cindy's song taken the night she disappeared. Cindy is 21 years old in this picture, stands just over five feet tall and weighs 110 pounds. She has long, straight black hair and brown eyes. Join me for our next journey into the unknown unsolved mysteries.